Welcome, everybody. Last day of the conference. I'm delighted that there's so many of you in the room. Nine o'clock, not an easy slot. Um, we have a, a nice program laid up for you today. I'm going to start off, but you'll see on the slide there a hashtag. Please, if you've not already been on Twitter and you feel like you want to ask a question from the panel, use the hashtag, and uh, we have a team at the front who will select some questions when we get to the question and answer at the end of the panel session. So, brief introduction for me. My name's Bertie Squire. I'm a, I have had the privilege of working at the School of Tropical Medicine for 21 years in collaboration with lots of individuals in many different countries on TB and poverty. And um, want to just uh, kick off with a very brief perspective over the time that I've been working on this. Just before we do that, supporting MSF's campaign, 495 days to step up for TB, um, for World TB Day uh, 2018. And you'll notice at the top of the list of things under diagnostics, it says no out-of-pocket costs and very relevant for the discussion we're going to have now. So a quick thing on where my journey in relation to social protection and poverty started. Um, we, the REACH Trust is an organization in Malawi that was interested back in the early 2000s on the costs that patients incurred in the journey from symptoms to diagnosis. And we were interested to look at what was the difference in proportion spent um, in people who were categorized as poor or less poor based on their asset scores. And the findings were really striking. So poorer people were spending 248% of, uh, of their monthly income on their journey from symptom onset to diagnosis. And that is in an environment where consultations, investigations, and drugs are free in the public health service. So these are costs that are incurred in relation to transport, in relation to organizing childcare, for example, and, and in lost income. So since then, there have been a plethora of patient cost studies. There have now been three systematic reviews, two in Africa. And I'm only going to just briefly touch on the, the last one, um, which came out in the European Respiratory Journal in 2014, and just select uh, one slide from that study, which, again, does the same as we did all those years ago, and it looks at care-seeking costs as a percentage of annual income. And the first three rows report costs against individual income characterized in a number of ways, either reported income or annual wage for the country or wage of the lowest, um, lowest paid 20%. And then the last row reports um, cost as a percentage of reported household income. And if you just look at the row that's in yellow, what you see is that for those in the lowest uh, um, wage category, 89% of income uh, really incurred in that care seeking. So we are talking about really very dramatic impacts on patients' livelihoods. So with that background, I want to just give you a sense of how we'd like the plenary to run. So first of all, we're going to bring a patient perspective, and in a minute I'll come and um, introduce you to Amy McConville. Then we're going to learn from global experience outside the TB community, Professor Margaret Whitehead, and then a bit of um, a, a learning from a middle-income country, so F F Fabio Veras from Brazil, and then we'll end with Diana Weil from WHO, setting the social protection in the context of the WHO NTB strategy. And then at the end of that, there should, if we manage to keep everyone to time, be about 10 minutes for questions from the floor and questions from the Twitter feed. Okay, so I'm going to leave, actually I will going to switch that off and walk across to introduce Amy McConville. Um, Amy's asked me to say, or rather I suggested that I should say, Amy doesn't find this kind of thing very easy, that's totally understandable, but as you'll hear, there are um, a whole series of reasons why speaking in public, speaking at all 
is really quite a challenge for Amy. I met Amy first when she was part of the National Institutes for Clinical Care Excellence panel developing the uh, TB guidelines which uh, were published earlier, earlier this year. And she gave testimony there and we use patient testimony in our NICE guidelines and it was really very striking. So, um, a little bit more about Amy. She's an established patient advocate in the UK and she's been an active participant in the fight against TB since 2006. She's the founding member and chair of the TB Action Group, TBAG. It's the only UK-based network of people affected by TB. And it was established in 2008 by the UK's TB charity, TB Alert, to provide a voice to people who have personal experience of TB and insights into what quality care and support looks like. So, Amy, if you wouldn't mind, as I recall, your symptoms started in 2004. Would you mind summarising a timeline for people? Um, yeah, sure. So, from diagnosis through to treatment and then ultimately cure, um, things were very far from straightforward in my case. Um, very likely due to the fact that I, I simply didn't fit a typical profile of someone at risk of TB in, in the UK. Um, so after 12 months of very slow physical deterioration, I did finally receive a di diagnosis of pulmonary TB. Um, but by this time, I'd lost three stone and weighed just five and a half stone. My hair was beginning to fall out, and my entire left lung had collapsed. Um, it really felt like my body was giving up on me at this, at this point. And my TB nurse described it as World War III going on inside me. Um, but the actual diagnosis came as a relief. Um, so, I, because I could finally put a name to this mystery illness that had made me ill for so long, I could receive the correct drugs that needed to cure me, and I was determined that once I was better, I just wanted to move on with my life. And um, I spent two and a half years on TB drugs and six years as a TB patient, with many ups and downs along the way, um, including relapses, hospital admissions, and further treatment for intermittent infections and side effects. One of the biggest shocks um, was later finding out that the TB had actually spread to my previously healthy right lung, which threw my treatment plan completely up in the air. But my, by that time, my left lung had become a reservoir of infection. Um, so eventually, I needed an operation to remove my entire left lung due to the damage caused by the TB. So what you may not know is that Amy uses the hashtag Twitter, One Lung Amy which uh, kind of characterizes what's happened. But yeah. what, if you haven't quite understood that time sequence, from a clinical perspective, it was effectively six years of illness, progressive lung damage and medical interventions, and including that removal of the whole of, whole of your left lung. Can you give us a sense of what was the impact on the rest of your life? Um, well, I mean, at the time um, I was diagnosed, I was a law student at university, and like the majority of students in the UK, I simply couldn't afford not to work during my studies. But by the time I was diagnosed, I was very, um, already very unwell. Um, I had additional costs, such as the TB drugs, which were not free um, at that time pre, um, prior to 2007. And there were travel costs to the clinic in London, and there were also non-TB meds as well. And these all added up to actually hundreds of pounds. So when the lung damage became so extensive, that I was forced to suspend my studies for 12 months, I actually found myself falling between the cracks in terms of um, what financial support was available. Um, I couldn't apply to university hardship funds because they couldn't be relied upon as the sole means of income. However, I wasn't eligible to claim means-tested state benefits because I still had student status for tax reasons. Um, so feeling pretty desperate by this point, um, I turned to credit and overdraft extensions just to support my day-to-day -day living costs and ensure that I could complete my treatment successfully. Um, I'd never been in any debt previously, so, but it wasn't long before things started to spiral out of control, and I felt under immense pressure. Um, returning to university, the debts I'd accumulated during this period of intermission caught up with me, and I fell behind with my university rent jeopardizing my housing situation. And suddenly I was facing the threat of not being able to register for the next academic year and 
possibly having to leave the university for good. Um, in terms of shame and stigma, in, in my case, and this was very much a barrier to accessing support services, including claiming non-means-tested state benefits, um, I was reluctant to tell my family and close friends that I had financial difficulties and that I was feeling depressed and anxious. Um, I feared how they might react, and I actually felt pretty ashamed of my circumstances. Um, it felt as if it was a personal failing. And I think there is often a public a perception which feeds into wider public attitudes that focus on individualizing responsibility and that the source of difficulty is actually down to poor choices or irresponsibility or that people just need to pull themselves together. And I internalize much of this. But the reality is that I reluctantly sought help as a last resort as a result of an unforeseen circumstance, illness. Um, and no one should feel afraid to seek support where there is a genuine need. So the unpredictable events that unfolded throughout my treatment journey meant that any choices I had were repeatedly undermined. The shame and the constant feelings of inadequacy made me feel powerless rather than empowered. And eventually things began to take its toll on my mental health. And my GP doctor diagnosed me with depression and anxiety due to the severity and prolonged nature of the, of the TB. And I had counseling from my university to recover from this. Um, throughout my entire treatment journey, my education was hugely disrupted. Um, but after seven years, I finally I completed my law, de my law degree and was finally able to graduate. So, if, if you look back now, what would you see as interventions that would need to be in place to have given you more support during, during that experience? Seven years is a massive chunk out of anybody's life. Well, I mean, first of all, I think promotion um, of NHS awareness amongst primary care providers, and they must think TB is a possible diagnosis, otherwise they simply won't look for it. And this can lead to delayed diagnosis and a greater risk of developing long-term complications. So I think more efforts um, are needed to improve understanding and clinical recognition of TB. Um, in my case, although I lived in a high-incidence borough, I didn't have any social risk factors, so I didn't necessarily fall within a well-defined category. Um, I think having someone, having access to an advocacy service, someone to help me navigate services at a community level, so someone who had broad knowledge, information, and awareness of different types of financial resources available, how to apply for these, and how to provide one-to-one -one support, as well as the tools to give people back their self-esteem and more control over their lives. Um, increasing access to patient networks, including peer support and other patient support initiatives. So the inclusion of support for TB patients is particularly important to not just, to treat, not just achieving treatment completion, but preserving and maintaining dignity while in care. So in 2008, with the support of TB Alert, the TB Action Group was formed to provide a patient voice and for people affected by TB to meet and share their experiences, as well as providing peer support for patients through their treatment and recovery. And I think we need to encourage the use of peer-led support group initiatives, which would provide structured talking therapy and motivate patients who might be struggling. Also, um, service user involvement and improving services at local and regional level is needed and learning to recognize and support um, the capabilities of people affected by TB and value what they can bring to the table as equal partners. The Patient Support Fund from TB Alert is essential um, for some patients who have no or little money, but such support needs to be funded by local authorities. In my own personal experience, meeting with other patients and influencing decision makers at local and national level to improve improved service delivery as an active member of TBAC. This gave me, at the time, a sense of purpose, a bond of solidarity amongst other TB survivors, and actually has been a real turning point in my life. Amy, I'm going to ask you about the Access to Learning Fund and what that meant in that time. Because well, we've, we've got to move on to the next speaker, so give us a quick synopsis of that. So to offset many of the additional costs I had, 
um, and my inability to work during my studies, I received a maximum award from the Access to Learning Fund. It's a government funded pot of money, and the aim was to put me back in the position I would have been had I not fallen ill. But three years ago, the government scrapped this fund as part of a much wider programme of cuts to public funding. It's now the responsibility of each university to provide its own limited funding for students through charitable means. The awards vary, um, with some universities more generous than others, and the eligibility criteria has been restricted to those who are most vulnerable meaning that many students in hardship are now missing out on vital support. Under this criteria, it's doubtful that I would have qualified for support, but it was a lifeline for me. And without, without the Access to Learning Fund, there was just no way that I could have completed my degree. Thank you, Amy. I think we should just, a big round of applause for you. Thank you for coming and sharing your experience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy, for sharing with us so eloquently your journey and your experience of all the medical, financial, mental, educational, social hardship that you experienced. Um, now we're going to move on to, to the next speaker, and I'm, I'm, I'm very happy uh, to welcome Dame Margaret Whitehead, who is Professor of Public Health at the University of Liverpool, she is the head of the WHO Collaboration Center for Policy Research on the Social Determinants of Health. She is visiting professor at Karolinska Institute. And for those of you who happen not to know it, uh, uh, Dame Margaret is, is a world leading researcher and, and thinker in the space of uh, social determinants and consequences of health. And we invited Margaret here to help remind you that even though uh, TB can cause very severe social and economic consequences, and as you've heard, even in a country that is supposed to have a decent social and, and health policy, that can be the case. But it's not only for TB, it's for so many other medical conditions, and a part of the solution is to look at the overarching social and health policies and ensure that there is universal health coverage as well as universal social protection schemes available. Um, Margaret, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, my slides are up. Well, thank you, and thank you for inviting me to this, because I've already learned a, a tremendous amount, and listening to Amy is, is wonderful to, to set this, this uh, subject in context. Um, today, my subject is social protection, and I want to actually set it in a wider context of this vicious cycle the poverty disease vicious cycle. Because poverty is a major determinant uh, of uh, disease uh, and ill health. Uh, it works through the social determinants of health. In the, in, in the um, case of TB, uh, we're talking of overcrowding, malnutrition, air pollution, etc. Uh, that really exacerbates the situation uh, and leads to the spread of, of TB. Uh, but there's also uh, uh, arrows going in the opposite direction, that poverty, uh, that disease and ill health itself uh, is a major cause of poverty. Uh, and that is through several pathways, one is the fact that if you are ill, if you fall sick, uh, then you uh, uh, are not able to work, to earn a living, uh, and you fall into poverty in that way. But more and more uh, in, in this day and age, uh, the payment for uh, uh, the treatment, the medical treatment that you receive, also is a major cause of impoverishment. Uh, in many countries. So we have this vicious cycle, this reinforcing cycle, poverty to disease, disease to poverty, uh, etc. Uh, and that's where social protection comes in. Social protection uh, acts on uh, the pathway from disease to poverty, trying to prevent poverty, 
Um, it also acts on the pathway from poverty to ill health to, to prevent the ill health in the first, case, in the first place. Uh, and then on the pathway where, which I've uh, termed the medical poverty trap, uh, we really need uh, action for, uh, towards a broader universal healthcare system, a push towards a universal healthcare system uh, to influence that pathway. Now, social protection. Actually, the need for and the demand for income maintenance uh, policies originated in the 19th century uh, industrial revolution where it became very obvious to the employers, not just the, uh, uh, the workers, uh, that protection was needed when people fell ill. Uh, and it benefited the employees. It also benefited the, uh, the industries, the, the, the employers. Uh, and it benefited the whole of society in helping to uh, integrate people into society. So it was a very important step forward. But what we have in the 20th and 21st century is the added phenomenon of a, a growing medical poverty trap. Paying for medical care has become a cause of poverty uh, uh, over recent decades. Uh, and that's brought about by the rise in out-of-pocket uh, costs for healthcare services, driving many, uh, many families into poverty and increasing the poverty of those who are already poor. Sick people face higher costs for health services, user fees for public services, fees for private care, informal payments, under-the-table payments, as they call it, and also for drugs, as we've heard already. And they have severe health and social consequences. Uh, and I want to put up just one example from uh, some work we did in China. And it's similar to uh, some of the studies that uh, Bertie already mentioned uh, about the costs to TB patients uh, of having a, a, a TB diagnosis. This shows in China uh, for different groups of patients, so low income, middle income, and high income uh, patients. And I've just highlighted uh, the costs uh, for TB patients. Uh, for low income TB patients, spending was 112% of annual income on medical care. For high income, TB patients, the spending was 32% of their annual income spent on, uh, this was spent on medical care. For both groups, high and low, uh, that is uh, exceptional. In the case of the low income uh, um, TB patients, is catastrophic. Uh, but what lies behind these figures? Uh, that's a real issue. What we have is people when they're falling sick uh, losing income because they can't earn a living, they can't uh, go to work, as, as we've heard already. Uh, but we have those who uh, need care, medical care, uh, but it costs uh, a lot of money. So you have, in the worst case, uh, scenario, those who can't afford the care uh, at all, uh, and they, uh, their health is, deteriorates uh, uh, very fast, uh, and they, have, um, they fall into the, the cycle, the, the, the uh, vicious cycle, uh, very fast. Um, those that do find the money uh, to pay for the care, um, they have severe financial and social consequences. Uh, you might wonder how uh, somebody can spend 112% of their annual uh, income. And the issue is that they go into debt, uh, they take out loans, it's an extortionate 
um, uh, uh, rates, interest rates. Uh, they, in some cases, sell off their assets, land, cattle, um, assets that they need for their future livelihood. They take their children out of school. Uh, and they also uh, revert to uh, all sorts of um, practices that in the long run lead to drug resistance. So they may go to a, drum, uh, a, a street corner drug vendor uh, and buy a, a small amount of the drugs they need, um, but then they can't afford the full cause, so uh, they stop before uh, they should do. And again, uh, we've got huge problems of drug resistance uh, in um, China and India in particular. So there are many different uh, and uh, severe consequences of trying to pay for care. And that's what I call the medical poverty trap. So what's the answer? Well, the TB campaigners for many years have uh, been saying that, well, we must have free TB services and care. And that's certainly a help. Uh, towards that, but as Bertie has already mentioned in terms of Malawi, where the care is free, uh, and in uh, places that have introduced the DOTS uh, regime, um, why? Uh, why isn't it a sufficient uh, uh, solution? Well, the, the fact is that free services are not free. Uh, the patients have transport, food, loss of income due to their uh, attendance, uh, and sometimes they don't uh, know that the treatment will be free until they have uh, a diagnosis, and they can spend a lot of uh, money trying to get, uh, get to the diagnosis stage. They also have to pay, uh, face stigma and staff attitudes when they are uh, trying to seek care that may be off-putting. Uh, and then we have the unregulated private practitioners, drug vendors, feeding the disease and drug resistance. Uh, and there is a distortion of the wider system uh, based on the fact that in many places, fees for services and fees for drugs supplement the income of healthcare providers and thereby distorting their, their uh, healthcare decisions and their prescribing. Uh, so um, doing something just for TB uh, won't uh, solve the, the problem. So working towards something more comprehensive, uh, the issue is uh, trying to introduce more social protection, uh, gradual change from direct payments for medical care uh, to social insurance system uh, and towards a universal health coverage and following the, the, the WHO strategy. But I want to finish on uh, two slides. Uh, one from OECD countries showing that people with disabilities are at greater risk of living in poverty, but social protection policies make a difference. Those with stronger social protection have managed to close the gap in risk and reduce poverty to a low level uh, on the, uh, your uh, right-hand side. But the, the final slide, uh, from a global perspective, the effect of social protection on uh, uh, TB. This uh, is taken from a Lancet article published in April 2016 by Soroka et al. Uh, and they showed that social protection spending is inversely associated with tuberculosis prevalence, incidence, and mortality. Uh, but even more than that, they found that the greatest predictive, predictive effect of increased social protection on TB burden comes at lower levels of social protection spending. The association is greatest, is strongest 
if a country is currently spending very little of their GDP on social protection and they increase uh, their spending by as little as 1% of GDP, there is a decrease in prevalence, incidence and, uh, and mortality uh, that is uh, stronger than in uh, higher uh, income countries. So this offers, I think, great encouragement for low-income countries where the burden of TB is greatest but the resources uh, are scarce. Uh, and so I hope that is uh, an encouraging end to, the, to my talk. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Margaret. We'll, we'll save the questions for the panel discussions at the end. We'll take some questions from the floor and, and keep on tweeting. I'll hand over now to my co-chair, Delia Boccia, from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Yes, so good morning, and thank you for coming this morning. Uh, thank you, Margaret, for the nice overview of on cost and how social protection can kick in and represent a solution. But now I, I think it's time to move into more some technical details about how social protection may work. And I'd like to introduce you, uh, Dr. Fabio Veras. Uh, Dr. Fabio Veras is an economist working for the International Policy Center for Inclusive Growth. Uh, the greatness of having him here is that he's a total TV outsider. And when he was introduced to me, he was introduced to me as one of the greatest experts of conditional cash transfers. And uh, we asked Fabio to share with us his knowledge and experience on where he sees the most obvious entry points uh, to make social protection more accessible to TB patients in Brazil. Thank you, Fabio. Thank you. Um, okay, I have the presentation. So good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming so early in the morning on a Saturday to, to this session. Thank you, Delia. Thank you, the union, for the invitation to come here. And as Delia said, I'm a, I'm a complete outsider on the TB world. Um, so basically, the presentation I'm going to give here is to have an overlook at the social protection in Brazil and to have a quick look at the literature on the findings of one aspect of social protection, which is social assistance, and specifically the Brazilian conditional cash transfer program, the Bolsa Familia, on TB patients. And actually, um, the only uh, strong evidence that we have is a paper that Delia is one of the, of the co-authors. So basically, what I did in the past month after the invitation was to try to do some research, look at what has um, been discussed in Brazil, and probing some of the policy recommendations with colleagues of mine uh, who worked for the Institute for Applied Economic Research in Brazil, which is a think tank that informed um, the public policy uh, in Brazil. So just to uh, set the context of social protection in Brazil, I think it's pretty much very important um, to keep in mind first that access to health and health in Brazil is a consti constitutional right, and it's for all citizens. So Brazil actually wants to have universal health coverage as one of um, basic rights of uh, our citizens. Uh, social protection uh, is also a, a right, some elements of it, but we don't have, and I'm going to show you this, um, this data in the next graph, we don't have universal coverage of social protection. So we have some citizens that fall, uh, fall, through, uh, fall through, the, through the gaps. But social protection, if you look at the cash component, that's basically what we're thinking here in terms of minimizing the catastrophic costs or minimizing um, the loss of income that the patients of TB, for example, may suffer when they, they have the disease, um, can be classified in two groups traditionally, right? So we have the contributory one, if you have links with the formal sector, and there is a set of benefits that help those who have a disease as well as uh, non-contributory transfers that help to increase the income of the poorest. And in general, and in the case of Brazil, actually, in all the cases of the social assistance programs, they are means-tested, which may be a challenge, actually, to be universal uh, for those who need when they fall uh, sick. And specifically, the CCT program is actually a social assistance program, so it goes into the non-contributory means-tested benefit. So here I'm going to uh, show this graph. I hope you can see it clearly. It's divided in two panels. So the first panel actually is for those below 16. So basically I'm calling, I'm calling them children. 
uh, even though UNICEF is below 18. Um, from 0 to 16, the definition here is based on the family. So they are going to have social security coverage. 47% of them have social security um, coverage because they are in families that have links to the formal sector. So they are protected for, for the social security side. The middle one are those who benefit from social assistance, specifically from Bolsa Familia. They correspond to 39%. And we have 13% of children below 16 that wouldn't have access um, to social protection, defined as the monetary, um, contributory, and non-contributory um, transfers. For the adults, uh, the definition changes. Here I'm not looking specifically to the family, except for both the family. So those who have a member in the family who is a beneficiary of Bolsa Familia, I con we consider them beneficiaries of Bolsa Familia because it's meant to be um, um, shared within the family. For the other ones, for the other benefits, I'm looking at the individual entitlements. So we have a much larger proportion of the population. If you look at individual enti entitlements, that's not covered by social protection. So it would be 30%, because basically are those who are inactive, so they are not in the labor market and the informal sector workers that do not pay contribution, but do not receive any sort of non-contributory social assistance. So we, we do have some gaps um, in terms of the universal coverage, and that's pretty much because the social assistance benefits are means-tested. Uh, I already um, commented on this proportion, so we are going to have basically the informal workers that are not going to be covered by social protection, basically because not necessarily um, they, are, they are poor. So now how the different components of the social protection can help in the treatment, um, uh, in the cure uh, of the treatment for, for TB. So basically in the social security, we have uh, the sickness benefit or the illness uh, benefit that in the case of Brazil requires for most diseases at least uh, 12 months of contribution before you get access to it, or formal contribution. For TB patients, and there are also for uh, other diseases, there is a wave of this requirement. So you don't need to have uh, any um, uh, spell of contribution before having access uh, to this benefit. What's the limit of this protection? Basically, it's only for the formal sector workers that we saw they, are, um, they do not cover everybody. We have the informal sector. Um, going for Bolsa Familia. So how uh, uh, Bolsa Familia could uh, provide protection for T TB patients? Basically, it would uh, provide protection for those whose family is eligible for Bolsa Familia. So it's not an individual entitlement, it's a f actually a family uh, entitlement. Having the benefits could uh, enhance uh, the treatment in two ways. Uh, first of all, it would increase uh, the food security, the access to food, and we have evaluations, evidence that, that show this. And also, it could uh, help the patient in the sense that it would put this, the, the, the patient in contact with the social assistance network and also with, with healthcare. So we could have uh, these two pathways. Right, what would be the limits uh, to the Bolsa Familia? There is a limit in terms of the demographic profile because there is a bias in the single registry and in the actual definition of, of Bolsa Familia that's a benefit that pretty much uh, it's intended to help or to support families with children. And you know that the TB patient profile is pretty much on the uh, older ages than in the younger ages. Um, but we do have some evidence, and, and basically I want to show you the results of this paper that Delia is one of the co-authors, that show that patients, the TB patients, uh, that do receive the Bolsa Familia, they have 7%, they are 7% more likely to be cured at the, at the end of the treatment. It's interesting also to compare uh, these results for a subsample of two subsamples of the, those who are under DOT, the direct observed treatments, and those who are not. And for those who are not, this impact is even larger. So for those who are not having this intensive uh, treatment that's offered by DOT, it's much more important to have access to social protection. So I think it's 12%, 11%, and for those 
who do have access is actually lower. It's 5% of the probability of Q. Right? So what's, what's the puzzle that the authors uh, point out in, these, uh, in their research is why we don't have many more TB patients receiving the Bosa familia. So one of the explanations is actually the different demographic profile. Um, and, um, and, and also there are some explanations about the technicalities of the paper, but I only have two minutes, so I'm going to, to skip these te technicalities. I'm just going to comment on some of the recommendations that could take place. For example, it would be quite important to try to disentangle what is actually the impact of the income and what is the impact of having better access to health service through the social assist assistance um, benefit. So one question is, could these results that were found for Brazil be generalized to other countries? It actually, it would depend on the structure of the health sector and the social assistance sector in the other countries. If it's similar to Brazil, yes. If it's not similar, it's important to disentangle the two factors to understand which one would be important to each, each country that would be um, thinking of. And in terms of how to improve these results using the Bolsa Familia program, I, I, I have some slides here showing that it's likely that this uh, result have improved because of the active search strategy incorporating groups that are more vulnerable to TB and to poverty, especially the families of prisoners, the indigenous population, and the homeless population. That's, that was a special effort that was done in 2011. So finally, um, just two recommendations for the program. It would make sense at the local level to improve coordination between the social assistance sector and the health sector. And at the national level, it would make sense to use the communication channels used by the program to try some sort of social behavior communication change strategies targeted to TB patients. So thank you very much. Thank you, Fabio, for offering this, um, you know, distant from TB perspective and hopefully unbiased perspective on, on this. Uh, now we move to the last speaker for this session, um, is Diana Weil. I don't think there is any need to introduce Diana, but for the two or three of you who doesn't know her, Diana is the coordinator of the policy and strategy unit of the Global TB program at WHO. She has been pushing forward this agenda on social protection for many years, and she's probably the person best placed to tell us where um, are the potential of bridging uh, better social protection and TB control activities. Thank you, Diane. Thanks so much, Delia. Um, I've also been um, encouraged, and I think right now is that this morning is a time for conversation, and we used a Twitter hashtag for social protect to get TB social protect, to get people talking TB and social protection. So I'm going to try now to be almost Twitter-like in going through my presentation so we have time for some discussion. Um, the objective here was, is this coming up? Uh, the objective in this presentation is to put uh, our TB and social protection discussion in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals and also to say probably more than anything else, it's about conversations. It's about conversations between people on this stage, people from different communities that are reaching out either to academics, to the social protection community, to the international development community, and very much among ourselves in the TB community um, and lung health community. I emphasize here in this slide that there, is, there are so many sustainable development goals, that's one of the challenge, but so many of them are related to poverty, are related to relieving distress, whether it's hunger, whether it's gender equality, whether it's peace and justice, and just to show us that we have a target under the sustainable development goals for social protection. And it's not one of the strongest targets numerically in terms of really pushing um, a, a numerical target but it says, implement nationally appropriate social protection systems and measures for all, including floors, which is a bare minimum, especially reaching the poor and vulnerable, and by 2030 achieve substantial coverage of the poor and vulnerable. So certainly TB patients, as we've heard from um, Dame Margaret Whitehead, are amongst those poor and vulnerable that we need to reach first, not last. 
This is a part of an infographic from the World Bank. As you may know, there's major push as no poverty is one of the first sustainable development goal, and that we've seen substantial progress on reducing the levels of extreme poverty worldwide. That measure has moved from $125, $1.25 a day to $195 per day. But we have an aim, and it looks feasible, to really reduce those extreme poverty levels by 2030. So for achieving sustainable protection for TB patients, the first thing is to prevent poverty, prevent TB through that poverty reduction, and then also hope that those TB patients are also less poor as we move through time and more able to sustain the shocks. And then we compensate for what they can't sustain in terms of shocks. In terms of the community we want to speak to, there is a strong and growing community on social protection. It's not well resourced. We feel like we're an underdog in the TB and lung health community. I think our colleagues in social protection also feel like underdogs. It's not an easy topic for parliamentarians and governments to talk about welfare and social welfare. It's often not the, the, the topic that many want to open up those, those discussions. But I think the sustainable development goals are giving us that push that we need to, we need to push on that envelope. And so a number of agencies, including the World Bank, the International Labor Organization, the Asian Development Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, are real leaders in this field. And I really urge you to look at some of their documents that are listed here. And I also want to um, encourage you to look at the WHO Global TB Report, Chapter 6 this year, in which we tried to cover universal health coverage and social protection and those linkages and indicators to get us started in that conversation. We know that there is um, a new initiative um, that's coming out from the ILO and the World Bank just this year to reinforce that movement on social protection. It's called a Global Partnership for Universal Social Protection. You'll see some of the agencies here that I mentioned already, as well as some major NGOs. We want to talk to the social workers worldwide, their associations. We want to talk to those that are looking at financial protections, such as CGAP, and looking at opening up the, the bank accounts for the poor um, worldwide. Those that are looking at other vulnerable populations, such as expanding pensions for um, age, those in advanced age, which, again, another vulnerable community we can learn from. We know worldwide from the ILO that there is an expansion low and middle income countries about the resources available. And I think um, Sergio had, had I mean, Fabio had presented some of, those, um, some of those streams of social protection. And so here in this symposium, we're talking mostly about social assistance, but certainly universal health coverage, which is another whole agenda that de deserves an entire plenary on that theme, is another subject we can talk about for reducing the direct medical cost for patients. We know we have our NTV strategy, as we all know, that has our dramatic focus on those cat reducing tr uh, catastrophic costs is one of the higher level indicators. And I have to say that that was a real achievement to get that indicator into that and have it approved by the WHO member states. I also want to reinforce that we have principles underlying the strategy, including human rights, equity, and ethics. And I think ensuring social protection is certainly central to those principles. We have, under our pillars of the strategy, we have two pillars that are relevant, including the universal health coverage pillar, and then the pillar on addressing TB within poverty agendas and uh, addressing TB and social protection specifically. So we're talking here very quickly about that social protection space. In our implementing um, the NTP strategy, we have a document called The Essentials, and in that we've highlighted, based on many consultations we've had over the last few years, a few of the key issues that are coming up for us in the TB space now. One is that many countries have social support schemes, but they're not well monitored, they're not necessarily consciously designed, um, and we need more discussion how to make them more efficient. They're not very sustainable as well, and so our biggest concern now is how to build on the platforms that are out there on social protection, such as Bolsa Familia in, in Brazil, to make these more sustainable. So we have, we have 
um, a, a long way to go on that, and we also have to use advocacy, and it's extremely exciting to see the advocacy community and p affected community of patients and um, vulnerable populations that are speaking now about their catastrophic cost burdens. We have examples from India. Yeah, we have examples from India on linking e-governance schemes, which are in very important, I think, in looking at how large-scale schemes can be linked up to enable access for TB patients. It's usually in the electronic, uh, electronic databases for TB, linking them to the electronic databases for the unique identifiers, an incredibly important um, area of concern for the social protection community now linking to bank accounts for cash transfers and linking to food, food support programs. We also have examples from Kenya, and I'll urge you to look at um, the documentation on the web from Kenya about linking up for the national uh, nutrition system and in enabling access to the cash transfer program that's now expanding in Kenya and all within the, um, the umbrella of their Kenya 2030 vision which includes a new social protection policy. So, work streams moving forward. We know we need cost measurement, which is why these patient cost surveys are so essentially important to show where we can act to reduce the cost within healthcare and beyond healthcare. We're mapping social protection schemes worldwide. We've done briefs for uh, all of the highest burden countries and discussing them with countries on what's happening in that social protection space. We want to discuss the programmatic linkages with the partners outside of TB, and very much what uh, Delhi will mention at the end of this, the Sparks Network, which Delhi and Knut are leading on in encouraging research in this space. We know that 30 high burden countries all have cash transfer schemes and social protection efforts, whether they're small scale or large scale, and we need to discuss and, and, and explore where we can engage. Um, so. I'd like to thank the community of people, and this is a growing community, so this is part of the list of people that are concerned in this area and trying to document what's going on and enabling programs and their partners to reach out and look for new ways to um, both eliminate upfront those costs or compensate for them once they appear. So thank you. Thank you so much, Diana. Uh, we don't have much time, a bit less than 10 minutes for questions. We, um, we were hoping for some questions from Twitter, but we are being uh, largely retweeted, which I take it as an endorsement, but not mm, too many questions. Um, so I wonder whether, uh, if any of you in, in the audience have a question, please raise your hands and we will make sure that you get the microphone. Um, so there's one person there, please. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Randall Reeves from Denver, Colorado. One concern I have is that uh, although we know there's a strong association with poverty and tuberculosis, is that if we're not careful, we may actually increase the stigma about tuberculosis. And I'll just give an example of a young woman we saw in Denver who had TB, and her husband, who was from a uh, BRICS country, working as a software engineer with a good paying job said, oh, my wife could not possibly have TB because she's not from a poor family. So how can we address the poverty issues without actually worsening stigma for the remaining part of the population? Thank you. Is it for anyone in particular or for the audience? So. I think... Uh, uh, good question, Randall. I think who wants to start of our panel to, to address that question? Diana. I think a first, a first point is brought up in this session, which is really let's, um, let's enable people access to the systems that they should have access to, where they don't have to declare that they're poor, but they should just know that service is out there. And one thing that we've really envisioned worldwide is that working with NGOs that can help overcome the red tape whether it's the local TB control officers in the United States that are helping people fill out their forms for whether they're social security payments or social welfare, or in India, where NGOs can help people um, find out where those services are, either walk over or even pick up um, the materials they need and enable people to get enrolled. So to me, that's the way that you don't ever have to have a conversation about your needs, but somebody else can help you get what you should have anyway. 
So we got a question from Twitter. Uh, how can we involve patients in decision making for social protection? Which I interpret, I, can we make sure that they become um, responsible and aware about what are the better options for them? Um, so there's a question about involving patients in decision making at local national level. Um, I think, I mean, the way, the way I've um, become involved in that is through um, TBAG, which is a patient network, um, and that was through the local tuberculosis charity. Um, I think it's about, so I think it's about patient networks and voluntary sectors working in partnership with stakeholders, so local government, um, as well as health stakeholders as well, just, you know, working in partnership really together. Yeah, and just to add uh, to Emmy's comment, I think that um, one issue is to be totally transparent with patients about their options in this field. And sometimes to navigate a social protection scheme in this country is incredibly difficult. So to allow them to make a proper choice and decision in a responsible way implies to communicate better the options and to help them to navigate the bureaucracy and the complexity of these schemes. Uh, I've been told that there is another question from this side, but unfortunately I can't. Hi, Hi radio. Yeah. Sorry. Um, as, uh, I'm Andrew Basham from Canada. Uh, my question is about the danger of creating uh, sort of perverse subsidies for disease-specific cash transfers and possible incentives to remain a patient or means-tested welfare programs, uh, which basically require you to remain poor to continue receiving benefits. Um, and it was mentioned before that, like, for example, the DOT, um, the, the people on Bolsa Familia were less likely to be on DOT than, or receive less money who are on DOT than those who are not on DOT. Um, I guess my point is that uh, wouldn't it be better to have broad-based universal basic income type programs which are providing well-being transfers, framing it as well-being for the whole population rather than focusing on economic growth and uh, means-tested or disease-specific cash transfers? I, I think this is a, is a, is a, you know, it's a recurring theme and I think it's a really important one. It's about the issue of, of reinforcing stigma, risk, and, and uh, it's the issue of possible perverse incentives. And I think you gave the answer to your own question, actually, which is to make the systems universal and avoid to the extent possible to talk about a disease-specific scheme that will label people into a very specific category. So see it as a rights issue that everybody, regardless of the illness and the disability and the social consequences, it's the consequences that are of interest and it's, it should be a right for everyone. Uh, that's my own opinion. I'd l like to uh, challenge others uh, uh, on the panel to reflect on this because I think it's a critical one. The sound here? Yeah. Okay, I, I think the argument is, is pretty much valid, but I think that action needs to be taken now. So we have TB patients that are suffering. We cannot wait for basic income grants to be implemented worldwide. And there are elements and there are ways actually to implement these incentives without generating this type of stigma. Um, to give an example of another area that I'm more used to because I'm an economist, one of the myth, myths around this type of transfer is that people would stop working because they would not generate autonomous income so that they remain, in a, remain eligible for these programs, right? That we don't observe in the evaluations of many of the CCT programs in, in Latin America and, and elsewhere. So it's not necessarily the case that if you give the trust of people will be always um, not willing to work or not willing to improve their health conditions to remain eligible. But of course, that's something that needs to be monitored and evaluation in each specific context. But we shouldn't wait for, to have a basic income grant elsewhere. It's a valid movement. Civil society should advocate for that. But to those who are in the front line, they, they need to give answers now. So there is, I think, the last question from the audience, and then we need to wrap up. Yeah, Dave, David Bryden from Results in the U.S. Uh, thank you for this really important panel and this urgent topic. Um, yeah, it's been a really good discussion. I, I, 
you know, I know that uh, the survey instrument that WHO has been circulating is, is gathering new information. I just think that's really, really important. And I would just urge the NTP uh, managers here, other you know, countries, to really engage with that. Um, you know, in this day and age, it's just outrageous. We've got uh, patients paying for diagnostic costs and as well as some indirect costs. And I just wanted to mention some civil society activists could not be here. I think the dialogue would be enhanced with community uh, participation. My colleague in Indonesia says, um, for the time spent accompanying persons to the health facility, these indirect costs sometimes are even bigger than the direct costs. And in DRTB, it becomes one of the most reasons why newly diagnosed people refuse to enroll in treatment. For my colleague, uh, Luciana Prilawati in Indonesia, so how can we really get more momentum uh, to, to address this? Who wants to t comment on this? Margaret? Yes, well, I think um, that really speaks to the issue of um, taking a broader view of the whole health and social system rather than concentrating on uh, a particular uh, disease. Because these catastrophic costs, uh, uh, and, and um, they are uh, a consequence of the system uh, be having user fees, having out of high out-of-pocket uh, payments, and really the solution to that is uh, a prepaid system in some way, a social insurance system uh, that would allow um, uh, people who are sick to get the, uh, the care they need without having to pay out of pocket at the point at which they are sick. So it's, it reinforces the overall system approach uh, that we have to, to go to. And again, it would uh, cope with the, with the stigma issue as well, as if it was universal. So I think the, the voice of, of these experiences of patients and their households and the households in general um, can be incredibly powerful, not just speaking to providers and to health services, but to parliamentarians, the examples of what does it mean to have a catastrophic cost? Is it acceptable? And it's really quite striking that countries, a good number of countries, are not paying the full cost of MDR drugs. Can a patient really ever pay $1,000 or $2,000 just for the drugs, not to mention the income loss given the severity of disease on uh, the amount of caregiving their families have to give them? So those kind of striking examples, maybe to us we've heard them too often. They don't sound striking. They're absolutely devastating stories to tell. So this is probably the most important thing that we can do is to show the human face of this social protection challenge. Okay, thank you. It's time to, to wrap up. I'd like to thank our, our eminent panel of, of speakers and, and all of you who came. Um, I think this topic, it's something we in the so-called TB community, we're sort of finding our feet uh, in this topic, but I think it's good to be reminded that there is a lot of work happening in other areas and other uh, health conditions with regards to social protection. And of course, the broader social protection research and policy development has been there for more than a century. So there, there are much lessons to pick up and we should continue this conversation. I look forward to the next year Union Conference and hope there are many submissions of symposia uh, that, are, that can dig into the details of some of the questions that we have addressed uh, here this morning. Um, I'll hand over to my co-chair. Uh, have anything to add or maybe Bertie to close up? So I really only wanted to say thank you very much. I, I don't have anything substantial to add, except I've been pondering what Randall said about this idea of making sure that we don't somehow reinforce this idea that TB is only an issue of poverty. And I think um, Amy always said to me when I was talking to her, she said, well, actually, I was relatively poor. But I think what, what we were talking about here was the need to emphasize that this is an aerosol-transmitted disease, so everyone is potentially uh, at risk and re-emphasize what Margaret said about the, the way to deal with this is with a more uni universal approach. 
And I think it's up to us in the TB community to take what we know about the disease and, and really reach out to these broader approaches. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming. And special thank you to our Twitter team. We only ended up with one Twitter question, but we'll keep the hashtag for next year. Thank you.